announcements. Uh, Men's Discipleship is canceled for tomorrow, for July 4th, and so you can celebrate your freedom from coming to Men's Discipleship uh, tomorrow. And so, no Men's Discipleship. Also, the Women's Study, though, is going on Tuesday. That's at 7 p.m. on Tuesday. And then also, we have First Wednesday Prayer at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. And so, with that said, would you go ahead and open up your Bibles to Psalm 37? We're continuing on through the through the Psalms, uh, verse by verse, we've slowed down a little bit. There's just so much here in chapter 37. And so we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 17 this morning in a message I've entitled, uh, Weather the Storm. And so as you're turning there, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity for us to, uh, to get together, uh, to get into your word. And I pray, Father, for those that are traveling uh, this week, that you be with them, Lord, and give them uh, rest. And uh, just a recuperation from the busyness of this life and, and that you would speak to them um, through the time and where they are and pray for those that are struggling with sickness Lord that you'll provide healing for them and quick recovery uh, Lord that you would reorient us today uh, that you would help us to see uh, wonderful things from your word and, and whatever it is that that specific thing that you have for each one of us I pray that we would have ears to hear Lord and hearts willing to obey in Jesus name Amen. Well, I don't want to brag, but, you know, last week, Brandy and I were walking through downtown Salida, Colorado. It was slightly more scenic um, than Midland, Texas, but we're just talking about things and, you know, the difficult seasons in life. And, and the, the Lord does did what he often does. He often speaks to me through Brandy. And so Brandy shared this. She says, we just got to weather the storm. You know, when there's difficult seasons in life, we just need to weather the storm. And really, that's the story you see throughout the scriptures. But they were as, as Christians, we're going to have difficult times. We're going to have hardships. And God calls us to weather the storm. Though, you know, faith and prosperity teachers on TV might tell you lots of things about how your life is going to be if you would just support their ministry. Please understand they're lying to you. The fact of the matter is life is going to be challenging. And it was interesting because Brandy went in a store and I was thinking about weathering the storm and I walked outside and I like to look around and take pictures of things. And I saw this electrical box that was covered with stickers. You know, as people walked by there, they would put a sticker for this, that or the other. But one sticker just shot out to me in the middle and it said this, no struggle, no story. And so the Lord put that together for me, weather the storm and no struggle, no story. And you look at that, every story that we enjoy, every story that we appreciate is a story of a struggle, of people overcoming something. And so that's what God wants to do in our life. See, each of our lives is what's called in, in kind of, um, you know, media, the hero story where the hero has to come overcome something, has to fight through something to become who they're called to be. And that's what God wants to do with you and I. But God can't create a hero story out of our lives if it's all easy. If everything is this slow, soft path, then we're never going to grow. We're never going to mature. And so God wants us to weather this storm because no struggle, no story. And God wants to make your life and my life a great story. A story that he can appreciate, a story that he can rejoice in. All right, so let's go ahead and recap the first few verses that we covered last week. I'll read those and, and then we'll cover verses 5 through 17 this morning. David writes, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. And so as we looked at a couple of weeks ago when we were in this passage, that we're not to fret or become angry, become hot because of evildoers, because the fact of the matter is their time of prosperity is very short. Their time of, of rejoicing, their time of getting ahead in life because of the wickedness that they commit is very short-lived. And so we shouldn't envy them, we shouldn't be worried about them because their day is coming. Well, they'll pass into judgment. Then he says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, as we continue, and we're going to see these same things. We're going to kind of come back to this over and over again. But the idea that we saw last week in those, or two weeks ago in those first four verses is get your eyes off of the evil. Get your eyes off of the wicked and get your eyes onto the Lord. 
Trust in the Lord. Delight yourself also in the Lord. Align yourself with him. And then what's going to happen? As you're aligned with him, he's going to give you the desires of your heart because you have a heart after him. You have a heart that wants what he wants. And so that's a quick recap of what we saw last week. Let me go ahead and read verses, or two weeks ago, verses 5 through 17, and then we'll get into it. David continues, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just, and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword, and have bent their bow, to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. So let's begin back in verse 5 with this commit your way to the Lord. So I want you to notice something as you're moving through this psalm, and maybe as you go back over it on your own or you pray through it, there's a lot of commands that David gives. David says things like, do not fret, trust in the Lord, dwell in the land, delight yourself in the Lord, commit your way to the Lord. So he's basically saying for us to do something. That's a reminder for us that the Christian life is not passive. If you're to go on this hero journey that God wants to take you on, you have to be active. There's a sense in which you and I cooperate with God. Where, where God guides, God provides, God gives you everything that you need to take this journey, but you still actually have to take it. He, he's not going to put you into a spiritual coma and just drag you along. Instead, he's going to expect you and I to do some work. And so this work he calls us to here, this committing your way to the Lord is very interesting because the word commit in the Hebrew is very interesting. It means to roll. It means to roll or roll away or roll down. That sounds, that's kind of weird. And so I thought about this. Your way means your way of doing life. You know, kind of your dreams and hopes and ambitions and expectations. And so what the Lord is saying to us through David, what the Holy Spirit is speaking through David here, is to us to roll our way, our expectations, our hopes to the Lord. Now, maybe this first illustration won't kind of uh, appeal to you or apply to you, but it is to me. I have watched a lot of action movies. I love action movies. And so often in an action movie, there's a villain who's surrounded. And he has a gun and he's holding people hostage. And the, the, the heroes have to get this situation under control. But you know, as I kind of thought about verse 5, I realized I'm the villain in the story. I'm the one surrounded by God, but I'm in a sense trying to hold God hostage. I say to God, hey, if you answer my prayers, if you do things my way, nobody gets hurt. <laughs> if you just submit to my demands, then everything will be fine. But the Lord says to me, I need you to put the gun on the ground. I need you to kick it over to me. <laughs> That's exactly what's being said here. This committing your way to the Lord is maybe if you're in a situation with you're angry with God, you're frustrated with him, things haven't, your way hasn't turned out the way you want it to, you're holding yourself hostage, you're holding others hostage, you're not listening to him, God would say to you, hey, put the gun on the ground and kick it to me. It doesn't have to end like this. It doesn't have to be that way. Now, maybe that's a little too aggressive of an illustration for you, so I'll give you a different one. I was also thinking of the Pilgrim's Progress. If you've ever read the Pilgrim's Progress, it's a story of this man named Christian who reads the Bible, and as he reads the Bible, he gets his big burden on his back. He realizes his sin, he realizes his difficulty, but there comes a point in Christian's progress as he walks and he sees the cross, and as he sees the cross, the burden falls from his back, and it's interesting, it rolls away into the empty tomb, never to be seen again, signifying the fact that Christian is forgiven. And so I kind of wanted to take that illustration 
to our ways. So often our ways, our hopes, our dreams, our expectations become this huge burden on our back. And we're carrying it around, and we're wanting things to happen a certain way, and God says it's not going to happen that way. And what God wants us to do with all those things is actually to take them off and roll them to the Lord. Lord, here are all my hopes. Here are all my dreams. Here are all my expectations. Here's everything I want in life. You do what you want with it. I want the life, the journey that you have for me, not what I have for me. Now, for a picture of what this rolling our way to the Lord looks like, I'm going to have you turn to a few different places today to, you know, just keep you engaged. Let's turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Again, looking at this idea of committing or rolling our way to the Lord, I think so often the Apostle Paul is a great illustration of this sort of thing. So we're in Acts chapter 20, and the Apostle Paul uh, is, is talking about his journey that he's on and is committing his way to the Lord. So we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 20. We're going to look at verse 17 through 24. Verse 17, Luke writes, from Miletus, he, that's Paul, sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to, to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Now we'll stop there for just a second to give you a little background. Paul is talking to these Ephesian elders, you know, he planted the church there in Ephesus, and he doesn't know if he's ever going to see them again. And so he's wanting to like share some, some last you know, uh, instruction with them, some last doctrine with them. And he's reminding them of how he lived his life. Continue on in verse 20. He says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, only good, awesome things are going to happen to me. I have a different translation. No, I'm just kidding. Notice what he says in verse 23. Except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. That's radical. I would argue that the Apostle Paul is the greatest Christian who ever lived. That'd be, that'd be my argument. Now, you don't, before you, you know, stone me on the way out, Jesus is not in, the, <laughs> Jesus is in a different category. But of Christ follower, I believe that the Apostle Paul is the greatest, and yet what does God take him on? He takes him on this hero journey that's going to be difficult, that's filled with trials and tribulations and, and shipwrecks and stonings and imprisonments and beatings and all of those things. But notice, Paul doesn't say, because of that, I'm going to quit. Because of that, I'm done. Because of that, I'm out. No, instead, verse 24 tells me that Paul committed his way to the Lord, that he rolled his way to the Lord. He says this, but none of these things move me. He says, none of these things take me off course. This storm that I'm in, he said, it doesn't move me. God is using this storm to take me home. He says, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. In order for us to give up our way to the Lord, we have to see that there's something better. As long as you and I think that our way is best, our hopes are best, our expectation is best, we're not going to let go. We're not going to give it to the Lord. But Paul saw there was something better. What was better? He wanted to finish his race with joy. That, that's what he wanted. He said, I want to cross the finish line. I, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what I want. And because of that, he says, well, I can't count my life dear to myself and finish well. So the only way to finish well is not to count my life dear to myself. And then as I don't count my life dear to myself, what happens? Well, I'm not moved. Because if I'm not worried about my life, my hopes, my dreams, my this, my that, then God can do whatever he wants with me. Because I know that the moment he takes me home as I'm walking with him, I'm going to finish in joy. I'm going to see him face to face and he's going to tell me that I've done well. So what a beautiful picture of what it looks like to finish our race with joy, to roll our way to the Lord. 
Now, of course, the Apostle Paul was simply following the example of the Lord Jesus. We don't have time to go all through the Gospels. If you want to see how the Lord Jesus obeyed the Gospels, I'm sorry, obeyed the Father, committed his way to the Lord, just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> it's everywhere. But I want to give you a couple examples from John. I'll read them for you. John chapter 5, verse 30, this is what Jesus said. He said, I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. He said, I've committed my way to the Lord. I've, ro or I've rolled my way to the Lord, and whatever the Father wants me to do, that's what I do. And then Jesus made this audacious claim in John 8, 29. He says, he who sent me is with me. In other words, the Father who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. When you and I use always, we, we usually use it to try to win an argument. You always want to go to the Italian restaurant. Really? Always? You always forget to take out the trash. You always, but no, when Jesus uses the universal, he means it. When he said, I always do those things that please him, that's exactly what he meant. He always did what the Father wanted him to do. So here's the key. The Lord Jesus always committed his way to the Father. And as a result, the Lord Jesus always did the right thing. So here's an application connection for you and I. The more that we roll or commit our way to the Lord, the more often we will do what is pleasing to the Lord. Okay. Please understand, no matter how much you and I grow, we're never going to be able to say, I always do those things that please Him. But we can please Him more than we are now. We, we can please Him more and more, though we're never going to do it perfectly. Think about this, that as, as often as you and I consciously say, I'm going to commit my way to the Lord. I'm going to roll my way to the Lord. I'm going to give Him my hopes and dreams and expectations. I'm going to put the gun down. I'm going to kick it over to Him. I'm going to take that burden of what I want and let it roll off my back as I look to the Lord. Then what's going to happen is we're going to please him. And let me ask you in all honesty, in all sincerity, what greater calling could there be? What greater calling in life could there be than pleasing the Lord who made you? Think about so much of what humanity does is for applause. The, the reason why people fight so hard to win a championship in sports is because they, they want people to clap for them. They want the feeling of accomplishment. They want, and, and I'm not, you know, you guys have known me too long to know I'm, I'm not criticizing athletics here. <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is we don't aim too high, but we aim too low. We seek to please people instead of pleasing God. And what could be better than pleasing God? Let's go back to Psalm 37. Continue on now in verse 5. We read, Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. That word trust, it means to have confidence in. To have confidence in. Well, you know, when our family was in Colorado last week, we got to go zip lining. You know, and, and when you get in the harness and, and you're, you're strapped in and you move off that platform, you're placing your trust, you're placing your confidence in all of that equipment. And, and the lines and everything else. And so this is what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to put all of our confidence in him. In this zip line of life, he wants us to step out and trust him in that. And then it says he'll bring it to pass. Bring what to pass? What is it he'll bring to pass the way that you've committed to him? So put the pieces together. Notice verse, verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Okay, all your hopes, expectations, your dreams, you're going to... Give that to him. And then as you have confidence in him, he's going to bring your way to pass because you've already given it to him. That's the idea that as we give everything over to the Lord, as we trust him completely, as we seek to walk faithfully with him, then he's saying, I'm going to bring your story together in the way that I want because I'm not having to fight you over it. I, you are participating with me in this thing. I don't know if you've ever, um, you know, been in a, in a boat where two of you had to row. Sometimes, I don't know if you, you, you know, for a kick, maybe when you're younger, you're like, let's do a canoe. Canoes seem fun. They're not very fun. <laughs> and you get in a canoe, you know, and if you're not kind of in sync with the other person, what happens pretty soon is you start going in circles. <laughs> And so you, you need to be in sync. And so the Lord's basically saying, hey, I want you to participate. I want you to get in the canoe with me. I want you to row with me. But here's the deal. You're going to have to follow my lead. And as we do it together, we're going to go somewhere. We're going to accomplish something. But the fact of the matter is it has to be together. We can't go out on our own and do it. So the Lord wants to bring it to pass. 
The Lord wants to, to have an awesome story for us, something that he's proud of, something he's pleased with, something that we can look back when we're in heaven and say, wow, God did some awesome things in my life, but we want to participate with him. This brings us back to verse 4 of this psalm. Look back at verse 4, if you would. Notice, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your hearts. As you're focused on him, as you just want to do his will, as you're praying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done, then what happens, your heart is changed to you really want what God wants. And then as that happens, God says, well, now I can give you what you want because it's what I also want, because it's what's best for you, because it's the good and then all of a sudden, you find yourself saying, yes, I'm doing what God wants me to do. So it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, let's continue on to verse 6. It says, he shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the new day. Okay. Now, the thing is, if, if you and I seek to be faithful believers, if we seek to walk in obedience, if we seek to stand against the spirit of this age and all the false ideas and all. If we seek to stand against that, we are going to be misrepresented. It's going to happen. Okay, we are going to be misunderstood. That's just the reality of things. We're going to be maligned. The, the more, also kind of the more influence you have as a faithful believer, then the more people are going to misrepresent you. The more people are going to misunderstand you. That, that's just how it is. But here's the deal. What we're told in verse 6 is that God will reveal that we were right and just. That when the time comes, God will reveal that we are right and just. That's what it's saying here in verse 6. He, you see, God will bring forth your righteousness as light, and God will bring forth your justice as the new day. So here's an application. Because so often, Christians, they kind of get down in the mud with unbelievers. And they were like, well, no, 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 this is what you should think about me. This is what you, no, no, no. We don't have to, and we shouldn't fight to be considered right or just. It is not your job, it is not my job to make the world believe that we're right, to make the world believe that we're just. We don't bring forth our righteousness. We don't bring forth our justice. God does. That, that, that's what, see, notice how much pressure does that take off of you and I when we don't have to worry about, well, if we're misunderstood or we're misrepresented or we're maligned or people are just trashing us on social media, any of those things, we don't have to worry about that because it's not your job, it's not my job to make sure our, that we're considered righteous and just. God's going to do it. God's going to bring forth our righteousness. God's going to bring forth our justice. For more on this, would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 for just a moment? Because this is kind of a situation that Paul encountered in the church in Corinth. Corinth, you know, was kind of the Las Vegas of the day. Pretty, pretty rough uh, you know, time there in Corinth. And, and, and so the, the Corinthian believers, they had some issues, some rough edges, some things that needed to be sanctified and changed in their lives. And, and, and so they had a lot of things to say about Paul and they were negative about him. And, and I just, I just love this. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Paul's going to talk about this. And he says here, he says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. I want to talk about those two words for just a minute. That word servant really means under rower. Okay, so it was a person who's down in the belly of a ship who's you know, chained to an oar and he's just rowing. He said, that's who I am. I'm an under rower for Christ. I, I'm just there and I'm rowing as I do what God asks me to do. Okay, he says, he says I'm, not, I'm not sitting up top on the cruise ship, you know, with my Mai Tais or whatever. He said, I'm down below. And then he also said, I'm a steward of the mysteries of God. That word steward really means a house steward. It's a person who oversees things that don't belong to them. A, a house manager. And he says, moreover, it is required in stewards or these house managers that one be found faithful. Okay, you got to do what you're, the right thing with what's given to you. He says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. <laughs> so Paul says, I'm not really worried about what you Corinthians think about me. I'm not really worried about what the court system thinks about me. And in fact, I'm not really even worried about what I think about me. He says instead, or he says, For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Paul was able to walk in freedom 
in the midst of all this misunderstanding and misrepresentation and all the hate and imprisonment and beatings because he knew that there was only one who could judge him, that's the Lord. Now, he didn't use this as a cloak for vice. Many people do this today, right? That you can't judge me. They're doing some kind of wicked sin. Only God can judge me. And we're like, well, God is going to. <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is, he thought only God is going to judge me. Therefore, notice verse 5, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart, and that each one's praise will come from God. Here's the problem. You and I want things to be judged right now. We want people to pat us on the back right now. We want wrongs to be righted right now. We want whatever we've done to be applauded right now. And God says to us, just wait. The day is coming when I'll bring forth your righteousness and your justice. Whatever rewards you should receive, you're going to receive. But the fact of the matter is just focus on me. Don't worry about what other people say about you. Don't worry about what other people think about you. Just trust in me. All right, let's turn back to Psalm 37, verse 7 now. It says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Okay, so here's the big idea before we kind of look into some of the pieces. The big idea of verse 7 is to focus on the Lord instead of on the wicked. Okay, this is, a, this is a theme all throughout the scriptures. It's that idea of, of, you know, instead of looking at the horizontal, focus fixating on the horizontal to get onto the vertical, to look up to the Lord. And so that's what he's saying. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. So I, I want to give you a, a dare. I'm going to dare you and I'm going to dare me to keep track for one day this week of how much time we spend focused on the Lord compared to how much time we spend focused on the wicked. How, how many Christians just have the TV on in their house, all just rolling all the time? And remember, then when it comes to, you know, news, especially on TV, there's a saying in the news industry, if it bleeds, it leads. They don't make any money off of good news. They don't make any money off of, hey, things are going well. So things are looking up. Things are, man, I tell you what, there's some families that are really getting along well together and they're loving each other. That does not sell. So if you and I are spending, let's say, you know, four hours a day focusing on the wickedness of this world and 30 minutes a day focusing on the Lord, there's, there's no mystery of why our attitude is what it is. There's no mystery of why we feel depressed and, and just sad about life because we're being fed that. So you and I, if we want to change our lives, if we want to change our attitudes, we must spend the majority of our time focusing on the Lord. We need to go back to, and I'm not going to turn there now, but I would encourage you to read Psalm chapter 1, you know, to meditate on the Word of God day and night, to, to think on Him. So fixate on the Lord obsess on the Lord and what's going to happen is you're going to find your yours and my perspective changed but if, if you and I spend all of our time focusing on the wickedness of this world things that we cannot change that you and I have no control over then we are going to be right where Satan wants us to be defeated frustrated upset and useless because we're focusing on things that God hasn't called us to focus on instead of focusing on him and seeking to serve him right where we are at this moment in history where he's placed us. Now, look at this word rest here in verse 7. It's a very interesting word. It means to be silent, to be still, to wait. To be silent, to be still, to wait. It's pretty hard for us to do. Turn off the TV, put away the AirPods, close the book, all of those things, just to sit and wait on the Lord. Just to, that's what he's calling us to do, to rest in him, to rest in relationship with the Lord. That's what it means to rest in the Lord. It means to rest in relationship with the Lord, to rest in that place knowing that you are in relationship with God. That the God who created you, the God who, who died on the cross for your sins before you were ever born, the God who called you, who's given you his spirit, that's the God that you can rest in. Now, to give you some help with resting in him, would you turn to Ephesians chapter 1? 
No, uh, you know, I don't apologize for being so exuberant, but I didn't get to teach last Sunday, and so I've got a lot of energy for it. And so uh, Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 3 through 14. Okay, I want you to come back to this. We're going to have to move through it quickly, but I would love for you to come back to this on your own when you find yourself uneasy, when you find yourself anxious, to realizing this is the Lord that you're resting in. This is who you are in Him. Now, again, if, if you're not a believer yet today, please understand that what I'm going to read through right here is offered to you, is open to you, is, is you have a, an invitation to come into this. Notice what Paul says. This is for the believer. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, notice, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. I want to stop on that for just a minute, because it's predestined, it's for adoption, that God predestined us that we would be sons and daughters, that when you get to heaven, God's not going to shake your hands. He's, he's going to hug you. <laughs> Jesus Christ is going to welcome you because you are part of his family. He's adopted you into his family. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. You can rest in the Lord because you're accepted, not because of who you are. Because I guarantee you that if you walk closer and closer with the Lord, you're going to see how bad you are. You're, you're going to become more and more, I would say, uncomfortable with how sinful you are, but you're not accepted because of who you are. You're accepted because of who is. You're accepted in the beloved, Jesus Christ. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, then the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we've obtained an inheritance, having predestined according to the purpose of him, here it is, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Let's stop there for one second. The end of verse 11 seems really similar to Romans 8.28. It's kind of a, a brother, if you will, to Romans 8.28. But I want you to encourage yourself there because as we look at it and say, I don't know how $5 gas prices can work together into his will. I don't know how the current political situation, social situation, any of these, I don't know. How, well, you don't have to know. I don't have to know. He knows. This is what the scripture tells us, that God is working all things according to the counsel of his will. I don't know how to explain it to you because it's experience I've been having lately that no matter where I turn, just in some way the Lord shows up and he's just, he's already been there. And, and sometimes I'm, I'm taking a bad road and the Lord's like, it's not where I want you to go. I, I don't know how to explain it to you, but I know that no matter where I turn, as it talks about in Psalm 139, the Lord's there. And, and so please understand that as bad as things may be, as, as murky as the outlook might appear, the fact of the matter is, God's still working all things according to the counsel of his will. The political systems of this world or the, 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 the unbelievers of this world, they can't do anything that God doesn't know what's going to happen. That, that God doesn't understand that. They're playing checkers and God's playing chess. God's got it under control. He's working all things. So you and I can rest in him knowing that he's working all things according to the counsel of his will. That he who first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. No one can snatch us away from the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to praise to the praise of his glory. Now, again, so much there. We don't have time to get into all of it. But one thing I want to touch on in verses 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit kind of in our parlance is the engagement ring. He is the engagement ring. In other words, God has promised that we're going to be his bride and God doesn't break his engagements. That the Holy Spirit dwelling within us is the guarantee of this inheritance, the guarantee that we're going to be taken into his kingdom, the guarantee that we're going to live forever with him. 
It's just wonderful, wonderful things for us to consider here. Now, as we turn back to Psalm 37, verse 7. Continuing on there in verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now, this word patiently, I was really surprised about in the Hebrew. It actually means waiting in the midst of anxiety, anguish, and pain. It means waiting in the midst of anxiety, anguish, and pain. And that was that was kind of threw me off a little bit. But, it, but then immediately I was reminded that this is how it's going to be like for the believer. For the believer, you're going to have times of anxiety. You're going to have times of anguish. You're going to have times of pain. And so the Lord wants us to wait patiently for him in the midst of that. You know, we don't have to wait patiently when things are well. You know, when you're sitting on the couch watching your favorite movie and got a blanket, some coffee with you, I'm just waiting patiently. No, you're not. <laughs> you're just enjoying comfort. But he's saying in the midst of your anxieties, in the midst of your anguish, in the midst of your pain, wait patiently for me. And he says, do not fret. Do not fret. Again, that means to become hot, furious, to get heated. He says, don't do that. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings the wicked schemes to pass. Please don't miss the obvious here of the second part of verse 7. Please don't miss the obvious. The wicked will prosper. Right? That's what it tells us. The wicked will bring their schemes to pass. In the fallen system that we live in, the worst people will often be at the top. The, the people who do the most wrong will have the most money, generally speaking. Will have the most power, will have the most influence. But that is not something for us to fret over. That's not something for us to be anxious about. That's not something for us to be angry about. And we'll be, remind, we'll be reminded of why we're not to fret as we get into verses 9 and 10 in just a moment. But for now, let's get into verse 8. Notice, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Again, David is, is, is making commands toward us. He's saying things like, Cease from anger, forsake wrath. That word cease is really an awesome word. It means to relax or let drop. Cease, to relax or let drop. In other words, anger is something we're holding on to. Anger is something that we're choosing. And it's amazing if you've trained yourself to be an angry person, you can do it at a moment. The littlest wrong, and all of a sudden you can think about all the ways that you'll pour out your anger on that person. And what, what David is telling us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, just relax your hand. Let the anger drop. And then that word forsake actually means to leave behind or let alone. So to, to forsake, to leave behind or to let alone, that's what we're to do with wrath. We're to let go of our anger, we're to leave behind our wrath. So it says. And so it's important for us to understand that this is the command we have. It doesn't say anything about, well, if, if they really did bad, then, you know, hold on to that anger. No, no, no. We're to let go of our anger. We're to leave behind our wrath. And it says, do not fret. It only causes harm. Don't be heated up. Don't be angry. Don't be wrathful. Because what, what we're being told here is it does not help. Okay? Oftentimes, people think they see an un injustice, and I'm going to yell and scream about that injustice. It doesn't help. It only harms James tells us in James 1, verse 20, the wrath of man, please hear me, does not produce the righteousness of God. It doesn't say the wrath of man sometimes produces the wrath of God. Or if you're angry enough, and that, no, 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 no. It says the wrath of man does not, and we could add cannot, produce the righteousness of God. Verse 9, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And so evildoers shall be cut off, and this really speaks of that they're going to die and enter into judgment. We saw this earlier in verse 2 of this, of this chapter, right? They shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. But it says, but those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. And this is a common one we're going to see over and over again throughout this chapter. And it reminds us of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5 in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In Pilgrim's Progress, as I've been listening to it lately, and there's, there's a kind of a more modern version of it that I would suggest to you if you're interested. Uh, but um, Christian is being taken into this, this kind of palace or castle sort of thing, and he sees these different people, and, and there's, there's one that's called Passion, and there's one that's called Patience, so these two children. And passion, he gets all these treasures, but he immediately he runs through them and he's left with nothing. 
where patience is waiting because he knows that his reward is coming later and it's never going to fade away. And so for us, it's very instructive. Am I more like passion or am I more like patience? Do I want it all now? Do I want the things right now? And I want to have it right now. And just please give it to me. However I want, I can get it. Let me have it. And it fades away. Or are we saying, Lord, whenever you want to give me my inheritance, that's great because I want it to last forever. And so this word wait here says, you know, those who wait on the Lord, it means to look for, to hope, to expect. You know, when a loved one is coming home, you know, back in the olden days, I feel like a dinosaur, you know, when, when I was a little kid and my grandparents were going to visit my house, I would actually walk to the end of the driveway to look. Nowadays, you just look at the blue dot on the phone. <laughs> and you just track their location to see how close they are. But this is that idea that waiting on the Lord is looking for the Lord, hoping for the Lord, expecting the Lord, and then he says that we're going to inherit the earth. That means to take possession of or occupy. So here it is. The day is coming when faithful believers will inherit the earth. But, but and I don't think it's bad news, but it's just the reality. It's likely that you and I are going to have to die to receive our inheritance. You see, the inheritance that God wants to give to us, the earth he wants to give to us, apart from the rapture of the church, we're going to have to die to get it. Because the earth that God wants us to inherit is the millennial kingdom. He wants us to rule and reign with him in the millennial kingdom. The, the, the earth he wants us to inherit is a new heaven, the new earth, new earth that does not fade away, where there's no more curse, no more death, no more lying, nothing that defiles. Verse 10 says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully on his place, but it shall be no more. What an awesome promise. What an awesome promise that the day is coming when we're not going to see another wicked person. We're not going to see another person who, who walks and who's unrepentant in their sin. And it reminds me of Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. I'll read it for you. It was right before they crossed the Red Sea. The children of Israel are so upset. They're, 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 they're just worried because here comes Pharaoh's army. But this is what Moses said to them. He said this to them. Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The day is coming for you and I. When all the unrepentant wicked of this world who scheme and cheat and lie and murder do all of those things, that we're going to see them no more forever. That we won't see them anymore forever. Verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So we're going to inherit the earth, we're going to inherit the millennial kingdom, the new heaven, the new earth, and we're going to have this abundance of peace, and that abundance means just what you think it means, it just means a whole bunch. This overflowing of peace. And so that's something wonderful to look forward to, but as you study the scriptures, you realize that you and I can have an abundance of peace here and now. So I want to give you just, just a few verses related to this idea of peace. One of them is Isaiah 26, verse 3, that says this, you will keep him in perfect peace or complete peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So this ties back to what I was talking about earlier about focusing on the Lord. So if you're a person who doesn't have peace and you want to have peace, well, then the scriptures tell you, they tell me, focus on the Lord. Keep your mind stayed on the Lord. That word stayed means anchored. Keep your mind anchored on the Lord focused on the Lord, clinging to the Lord, and as you trust in him, you're going to have peace. This is what Jesus said in John 16, 33. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So he says, if, if you're focusing on the world, realize you're going to have tribulation. That's just part of the deal. But in me you can have peace. As you focus on me, Jesus is saying, then you can have peace. And then I want you to have to turn one other place. That's Philippians chapter 4. Because if you've never marked this in your Bible, my hope is that you'll mark it now. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. I want to look at verses 6 and 7 here. 
We don't have time to get in verse 8, but verse 8 would be a great place to, to think about, about focusing your, your mind on the Lord, focusing on the good things, fixating on Him, um, anchoring your mind on Him. But what I want to look at right now is verses 6 and 7, speaking about peace. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Okay, so verse 6, it's interesting that though maybe some of us are more naturally anxious than others, anxiousness is actually something that you have to feed. Okay, and so we can feed anxiousness. And kind of coming back to, um, you know, the, the news, the news makes money off of your anxiety. The, the news makes money off of your worry and your fear. Okay, and so instead of feeding anxiety, Paul tells us instead of doing that, do something constructive, pray. You know, ask for things from God. Um, thank God for what he's done for you. And then this is the result. Instead of feeding anxiety, praying and asking God for things, thanking God, what will happen, verse 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's impossible for you and I to focus and fixate on the Lord, to trust in who he is, to make our whole life about getting to know him, and talking with him and asking him for things and thanking him to, to we're going to find ourselves to be less and less anxious that's just the reality and so if you and i are, are just anxious all the time then usually what's happening is we're not focusing on him we're not anchoring our minds to him and then again verse eight you can look at it on your own but it just shows you things to focus on things to set your mind upon so that you might have that peace all right, let's turn back to Psalm 37 as we move into verse 12 now. It says, The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. Just real quick, don't be surprised when this happens. Don't be surprised when the wicked plots against you and gnashes at you with their teeth. Paul warned us in Ephesians 6.12 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. The reason why people that are unbelievers are the way that they are is because whether they realize it or not, they're being influenced by demonic powers. The reason why people are riding in the streets because they don't have the right to kill their babies anymore is because they're empowered by the demonic. If, if that's not demonic, I don't know what is. I will kill you because you won't allow me to kill my baby. That is just, it's, it's diabolical, quite literally. And, and that's what we have here. So for you and I, when we're surprised that the world comes against us because we're following Christ, we haven't read the book enough. We need to remind ourselves, yeah, I, I hate it. I don't enjoy this. But it's exactly what was going to happen because that's what happened to all the prophets. That's what happened to Jesus. That's what happened to the apostles. That's what happened to every faithful man and woman who served God throughout human history. Verse 13. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. That word laugh there, it means to laugh in contempt or derision. As the Lord does not laugh at the plight of the just, but at the stubborn foolishness of the wicked. In other words, this idea is that God is just like, you know how when you, when you watch a video of somebody doing something stupid and you're just like, I can't believe how dumb they are. That's really what God is laughing about at the unbeliever. I can't believe this. It's just too much. And so we don't have time to turn there, but on your own, you can look up Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2 is kind of the same thing where, where the nations get together, they rise up against God, and they're going to overthrow him, and God looks at them and he laughs. Because you can't stop the Lord. Verse 14 and 15 says, The wicked have drawn the sword and they bent the bow. They cast down the poor and the needy to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. So in other words, what the wicked plan for others will come back on them. The, the, and we see this throughout the scriptures. Saul constantly tried to kill David and they ended up falling on his own sword. We see Haman wanting to hang Mordecai but being hung on his own gallows. This is, this is the end of the wicked. The idea, the thing to take away from verses 14 and 15 is that judgment will fall. Okay? The problem for you and I, when we don't commit our way to the Lord, we don't roll our way to the Lord, is that judgment doesn't come quick enough. 
I want judgment to come now. I want it to happen now, now, now. And the Lord says, just hold on. Who's running this show? He says, judgment's going to fall, and maybe not in this life, but it will fall after death, for sure. It says in Hebrews that it's appointed to man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Verses 16 and 17, our last verses for today. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. So this is very, you know, Proverbs-ish here. It's better to have a little in this world and to be upheld by the Lord than to have great riches in the world and for God to break your arms. Now, this breaking of arms is not just like, well, the guy's got a couple double cast and it's a, it's a bummer. No, it's this idea of destroying one's power, uh, of like breaking their arms so they can't hold riches anymore. It's speaking of God's judgment. So what he's basically saying is it's not worth it to go with the way of the wicked because however much the wicked has, eventually his power is going to be broken and he's going to have an eternity separated from God and it won't have been worth it. Now we'll stop there for today and then we'll move into our time of communion in just a moment. But, but I, I just want to encourage you that in the storm that you're experiencing in this life, you know, it's often been said about the Christian life, you're either going into a storm, in the middle of a storm, or going out of a storm. That's really how it is. I want to encourage you to weather the storm. I would encourage you to rest in the Lord. I encourage you to not go AWOL from the hero journey that God has for you, for the thing he wants to make out of you, that the blessing that he has for you, the, 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 the story that he's writing as the author of your life. Because God is going to give you that power to weather the storm. And I want you to remind yourself that no struggle, no story. That's what makes a great story. And God is the most creative being ever. He wants to write a beautiful story through your life. But for you and I, we have a choice. Are we going to participate in it and trust him? Or are we going to go our own way? If we go our own way, it's not going to turn out well. It's not going to be what God wanted. But the good news is that no matter how far you've strayed from that, if you're willing to get back into the story, God's always willing to write you back in. If you're willing to participate, to roll your way to the Lord, He is willing to write a beautiful story of your life. Let's pray. Lord, do thank you for uh, this opportunity that we have to, uh, to come before you, Lord, to get into your word and and to, to think about what you're doing. I pray, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see. Lord, what's important? Lord, give us eyes to see the truth. And even as we move our attention and our focus upon uh, the cross, Lord Jesus, and taking communion, uh, Lord, we know that uh, your disciples wanted to move you from going to the cross. Lord, they couldn't understand it. They couldn't understand that part of the story. And and Lord, we thank you that you did not shrink from the cross, but for the joy that was set before you, you endured the cross, despising the shame. And so, Lord, I thank you that you were willing to die on that cross for each one of us as individuals. Lord, thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Thank you for the daily forgiveness that you give to us. I pray that you would empower us to forgive others, to love others, to, to walk out this calling by your Spirit. And so, Lord, as we move into this time of communion, I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would be at the forefront of our minds. Lord, that we would know that we're fully forgiven, that we're fully accepted in you, the beloved, because of your finished work. So we thank you for that. I pray that we would rejoice in In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Jesus, Lord, thank you, Lord. We trust that you are able. Thank you for your word today. That we didn't need to worry about anything but from everything by prayer and supplication and things given in this request. Uh, uh, give our voice to you, Lord, and your peace will. Uh, your peace will transcend all our understanding, Lord God. In Christ Jesus, and we just thank the Lord for for uh, just taking care of us. Thank the Lord for uh, our. We have a bright future, Lord God, because of you. Can uh, see you, Lord. Uh, we can wait to see you, Lord God, and just just pray for your blessings, Lord, for those who are traveling, and for this week, Lord God, just just be glorified, Lord, as we celebrate uh, this weekend, Lord, and just give you all the glory and praise in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Thank you. 